professor. Yes, we, we continue our session with Professor Frankel from University of California at Berkeley, and he will speak about analytic language correspondence for complex curves. Please. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Um, number theory and uh, physics uh, has been a sort of an interplay, a, a, a arena of uh, interplay of many exciting ideas in recent years. And uh, so I think it's a, it's a very timely uh, conference you know, on the subject. So um, today I want to talk about uh, some recent um, some recent work related to this because it, it will be about language correspondence, which on the one hand uh, touches upon things that are familiar from quantum physics, such as two-dimensional conformal field theory. But on the other hand, also uh, could, be, could be linked to some uh, uh, problems in the classical language correspondence. So let me share screen with you. All right, so analytic language correspondence for complex curves. Um, this will be about uh, a joint work uh, with Pavel Etingov and David Kashdan. We now have three papers on this topic. Two of them are uh, on the archive. And the third one, hopefully, we'll, we'll post it soon as well. And uh, this work was motivated by a suggestion of Robert Langlands himself and also some results of Jörg Teschner. And motivated by this, we propose an analytic version of the Langlands correspondence for complex curves. Um, to set it up, perhaps I should re recall that in mathematics, Langlands correspondence can be formulated in three different scenarios, three different languages, so to speak. Uh, and it is convenient to talk about this in, in a framework of a kind of a Rosetta Stone that was uh, put forward by Andre Wey in his famous letter to his sister in, in 1940. The, the three scenarios, or so three columns in this Rosetta Stone, are number fields, curves over finite field, FQ, and curves over the field of complex numbers. But today we could also say that this is not just a trilingual text, but it is more a text with four languages. And the fourth comes from quantum physics. Um, exploration of S-duality in four-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory, as well as mirror symmetry in two-dimensional quantum field theory can be viewed as this fourth column. In fact, um, since the, since the late 70s, physicists have known that certain elements that mathematicians have observed in the language program are also present in this duality. Uh, in uh, famous works by uh, Mantonen and Olive and Goddard Knights and Olive, the Langlands dual group made its appearance. So under this duality, the gauge group G gets replaced by its Langlands duo, even though the Physicists at that time were not aware of this. But um, soon after that, the link was made and uh, it remains sort of a big mystery until in 2006, Anton Kampustin and Edward Witten were able to link uh, as duality to the geometric categorical language correspondence, which is what we had, we, 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 we thought was the flavor of the language correspondence appearing for curves over complex numbers. But today I'm going to talk about a new flavor, which is in addition to the geometric categorical language correspondence that has been familiar uh, to us um, in the last 30 years. And that has been also uh, kind of the interface between that geometric and categorical correspondence and uh, as duality has been also the, uh, inspired a great deal of research after the work of Kapustin and Wait. So this new flavor, uh, uh, is complementary, but is interesting, and it's intertwined with categorical geometric correspondence, as I will try to explain today. And I also want to say that actually, um, David Gayot and Edward Witten um, have already given a very nice interpretation in the language of S-duality and brain quantization of some of the results in the analytic language correspondence, this new flavor of the language correspondence that I'm going to talk about today. Actually, Edward Witten will give a talk at this conference later today. So I imagine that he might talk about some of this. Okay, so um, to set the stage, I would like to compare, I would like to compare these two columns, curves over finite fields and curves over C. Um, 
how things are done in a classical language correspondence when you have a curve over finite field. Um, I will look at the so-called unramified language correspondence, uh, but much of what I'm going to say generalizes to, to other, to more general setting. So you have a reductive algebraic group G. In fact, for the purposes of this introductory discussion, you might think it's just GLN or SLN uh, over finite field. And you have an, a, a smooth projective curve over finite field. For example, projective line, which you can think of as uh, something where functions are, rational functions are just ratios of polynomials uh, in one variable over finite field. So then we have uh, band G, band G of FQ. And this is a notation for the set of isomorphism classes of principal G bundles on X. Uh, in general, it has a, what's called adelic realization. So it can be represented as, as a double quotient of the group G over the ring of adels. But to simplify matters, let us suppose that the group G is simple. In this case, we can just use one point instead of adels, which kind of, um, which kind of take into account all points of our curve. We'll just pick one point X over FQ. Let's assume that there is an FQ point. It's not an essential assumption, but let's do that. Then this set of isomorphs classes can be represented as a double quotient. And what do we have here? This is a kind of a, this is a, kind of a loop group, if you will. Uh, um, because you can see the group G over Laurent power series uh, over, over finite field, where the variable, you, you think of it as a coordinate at the point. So in fact, a good illustration here would be, uh, I would make an illustration here, uh, forgetting that this is a finite field, but imagining that we actually work over complex field, then we could draw our curve as a Riemann surface. And then this will be a point so we'll have a disk around this point. This is point X. This is a disk around this point. Then a bundle can be trivialized away from this point it can, and also on the disk around this point. And so then it is, can be represented by transition function between these trivial bundles, which is an element of the loop group. But if we change the trivialization uh, on the disk, we will multiply this transition function by an element of the kind of um, Taylor part of the loop group. And if we change the realization away from this point, we will multiply by, by, this, by an element of this group. That's how you establish a nice morphism between this set and this double quotient. So in, if the curve is over finite field, where of course I cannot draw it like this because you can, it's more like a discrete, a discrete thing, but morally it is like this, right? So uh, there is something nice happens that this is actually a discrete countable set. And moreover, it has a natural measure. Uh, so for every G bundle, or equivalence class of G bundles P, you, are, you, uh, you assign to it its measure, which is one divided by the order of the group photomorphisms. This is well-defined and meaningful because all of them are finite groups. For instance, the trivial bundle has as the group of photomorphisms, the group G with Q itself. So say GLN or with Q. So clearly it's a finite group and you can count how many elements there are. And, the inverse of that is going to be the measure assigned to the trivial bundle. So we can use this measure to define the natural emission inner product on the vector space of complex valued functions on this set. And then we define in the usual way the Hilbert space of L2 functions on this set, those functions for, for which the norm converges, the integral converges, the L2 norm converges. That's how it's done in the classical language correspondence uh, when you have a curve over finite field. So then what is the Langlands correspondence about? It's about a bijection, ideally, although sometimes it could be a finite to one correspondence for general groups. For GLN, it's really, it really is a bijection uh, between two sets, which are of totally different nature. There are two sides, the automorphic sides where we have this Hilbert space that I talked about just now. This Hilbert space carries commuting heck operators labeled by points of the, of the curve and dominant integral co-weights, or think of it as the dominant integral weights of the dual group. They commute, they, the integral operates, they act on the space, and we can talk about their joint spectrum. So that's one piece of data, that's one set. And the other side, Galois side, we consider objects of a totally different nature. Since I'm talking here about the unramified case, I added this adjective, but in principle, this could be removed. Uh, homomorphisms from the, um, 
this is reflected in the fact, by the way, that I'm taking here the double quotient. If I didn't take the quotient here by this subgroup, then we, we would be considered full-fledged, not only unramified as well as ramified correspondent. But because I took the quotient by this subgroup, we are in the unramified setting. So uh, on the Galois side, we can see unramified homomorphisms from the Galois group of what? Of the field of rational functions on this curve. If the curve is P1, it is just the field of, of fractions, ratios of two polynomials, as I already mentioned, or we, in one variable over finite field. To the Langlands dual group, right? Well, I am simplifying. Um, there are some subtleties. Uh, more precisely, instead of the Galois group, we should take the Bay group, as, which is a sm slightly smaller, plus some more data in general. But, but roughly speaking, that's what the Langlands correspondence for curves over finite field is about. It's about matching this, the joint spectrum of commuting Hecke operators acting on this Hilbert space that I described and unramified homomorphisms from the Galois group to the Langlands dual group. This is the place where the dual group, Langlands dual group appears. And, and, and the Langlands dual group, of course, has been like a, a, a litmus test for all things Langlands that we observe both in mathematics and in quantum physics uh, uh, as duality of gauge, uh, four dimensional supersymmetric gauge theories and so on. So more precisely, suppose you have a specific eigenvector in this Hilbert space uh, of the sec operators then the joint eigenvalues, it turns out that the joint eigenvalues are encoded for the group GLN. This is actually Ethereum. So we, by, due to the Dreamfield and, and, and Lafork, Laranda Fork. So joint eigenvalues of the Heck operators on the specific eigenvector are encoded by a specific homomorphism from the Galois group to the dual group, which in this case would be GLN also. There is a way to extract the Heck eigenvalues from a homomorphism by looking at what's called Frobenius conjugate classes. If, I'm not going to get uh, deeper into this as this would take us too far afield. And, and moreover, this packaging of, um, of eigenvalues by Galois representations sets up a one-to-one -one correspondence. So you can think of this as a kind of a, a link between a, que a question in number theoretic question, which you could say, you could say it's a kind of a number theoretic question, something that has to do with Galois side, even though in, in, we are doing it in the function field context, but in the number field column of the Andre Weiss, Rosetta Stone does something very similar. And the statement is that those data actually can be accurately described by Heck operators, by eigenvalues of Heck operators. So that's the miracle of the Langlands correspondence that there's two things which look up completely separate and different, they're not to be related. Okay, so now suppose that instead of a curve of a finite field, we have a curve over the field of complex numbers, or think of it as a compact, compact Riemann surface. Okay, so then we also, we can also consider the set of isomorphism classes of principal G bundles on X, bound G of C. And again, we have this double quotient. In fact, I have already illustrated how this double quotient come about, comes about in this specific case when the, curve, when the ground field is a field of complex numbers. However, there is a big difference with the case of a curve over finite field. It is not possible to define integration measure on the set in the same way as over Q because these groups of automorphisms can now be infinite. For instance, if you take a, a trivial uh, a G bundle for a curve over complex numbers, what is the group of automorphisms? It is the group, uh, it is going to be the group, it's a compact Riemann surface. So it's going to be just a constant of automorphisms. So the group, it will be group G of C. Well, it's not finite. So you cannot just take the number of elements and take its inverse. You're going to get zero everywhere. So, or on a big chunk of the modular space. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't make sense. For this reason, so of course the pioneers of the Langlands correspondence over complex numbers were aware of this. And so what they suggested is that we modify the setting and formulate the Langlands correspondence, not in terms of functions, the way it's done for curves over finite field, but in terms of sheaves. And that's why this is usually referred to as a geometric or categorical language correspondence. Here I should mention the, the names of these pioneers, uh, Dreamfeld, Lamont, Bellinson, and others. So th there is actually some system, there was some system to this because for curves over a finite field, you can, um, Grothendieck has taught us that sometimes sheaves can give rise to functions. So if you are over a finite field, you can, you can basically take trace of the Frobenius on the stalks of a sheaf and you get a function. It, which I, you know, I like to talk about 
this as a first example, known as far as I know, of categorification, where you really go from a vector space, vector space of functions, to the to a category of sheaves. Uh, this term was not used, was not was not um, uh, fashionable at the time, but now it is. But of course, we talk about the growth and group of this category, so growth and is remembered, of course, in this context. So. Um, over a finite field, you can do both sheaves and functions. And it was observed that sometimes the automorphic functions we talked about earlier could actually come from sheaves on the moduli stack of G bundles. And, that, and then the, the pioneers of the language correspondence over C took that as a guiding principle. So instead of the space of functions on band G or something like Hilbert space that I talked about earlier, can, we consider the derived category of D modules on band G. Here, D stands for the sheaf of differential operators, and D modules are modules over the sheaf. And instead of Hecke operators, we consider Hecke functors. Now, as Kapustin Witten explained, this has a physical, this is, has a counterpart in physics, namely the category of A brains on the Hitchin moduli space um, of Higgs bundles associated to the curve X and the group G with respect to the symplectic form that is usually denoted by omega K. As we end at Hoft line operators, which act as functors on this category. So they are the counterparts of the Hick operators. That's on the automorphic side. On the Galois side, then, we should have a derived category, suitably modified, of coherent sheaves, or O modules, if you will, on the moduli stack of flat LG bundles on X. The definition is, is rather subtle, and it was only given recently by Arinkin and Gaiskuri, even though this, this was kind of envisioned by Balance and Drinfeld earlier. In physics, uh, as explained by Kapustin Witten, the counterpart is the category of B brains now on the Hitchin moduli space associated to Langlands dual group hmm? with respect to the complex structure I in which it appears as a cotangent, almost as a cotangent bundle to Panji, with Wilson line operators being, being the duals of the Toft line operators. They, of course, also have an analog in, my, in, my, in this category uh, of coherent sheets. Okay, so that's the setting of the of the categorical angles correspondence, and you can see that it looks kind of like non-abelian Fourier Mukai transform. In fact, if we take as a group G the group GL one or the, the, the just a multiplicative group, then it is a, a version of a Fourier Mukai transform, which was proved by by uh, Lamont and Rothstein. And I believe it was Balance and Jernfeld who suggested to view the categorical angles correspondence in general as a as a non-abelian generalization of that. And then it took some years to really formulate it more precisely, which was done more recently by Arinkin and, and Gates Green. This was this point of view has been the prevailing wisdom for how Langlands correspondence should be interpreted in the third colon of the Rosetta Stone, curves over C for the past 30 years. However, it turns out that in addition to that, there is also a rich analytic Langlands correspondence for complex curves, in which we really have functions, things connected to functions. Yeah, more precisely, I have densities, but okay, it's kind of like functions and a Hilbert space. And, and operators, honest to goodness, operators acting on this Hilbert space rather than functors acting on categories. Moreover, the two versions, categorical and analytic, complement each other. And we can use each of them to gain insights about the other. So I think that we we'll probably be able to learn more about the geometric correspondence by studying analytic. And we have already learned quite a bit about analytic correspondence by using the results uh, obtained in the geometric one, the geometric slash categorical one. In fact, you know, as, a, as a, I, I could say, as a half joke is that it, it was a historical accident in some sense, looking back, that we, um, we moved in the direction of studying so um, in depth, you know, so uh, intensely this categorical correspondence and not trying to develop the analytic language correspondence in the past 30 years. It could have really been the other way around. And I think it would, either way, the other side would have been forced on us after a while. So they kind of, because they're really uh, kind of connect, joined at the hip. And so here I should give credit to Robert Langlands who actually was adamant uh, ever since I, you know, I collaborated with him and, and, and Ngo Bar Chao around, you know, 2008, 2009, 2010. It's adamant that why are you guys only doing shifts instead of functions? And so he was right. Yes, there exists a, a function theoretic slash analytic version of language correspondence. Now, in, in hindsight, this is not so surprising because 
in two-dimensional conformal field theory, we know that there are two types of correlation functions. There are, the re there are real physical correlation functions, which are single valued by linear combinations of conformal and anti-conformal blocks. Mathematicians are usually interested in conformal and anti-conformal blocks because in many cases they can be studied algebraically, purely algebraically, so it's or holomorphically. But physicists have known all along that, uh, you know, this is not all there is to conformal field theory. At the end of the day, you have to couple uh, chiral and anti-chiral sectors to really get single valued uh, correlation functions because conformal blocks are going to have monodromies and so will anti-conformal blocks. But in, a, in good situations, the, the monodromies are dual to each other wherever and you, you are able to find a single valued bilinear combination or cisco linear combination. That's the analogy. So the Krikorev -like Langlands correspondence is like conformal blocks. It's like studying conformal blocks. And the analytic Langlands correspondence is like studying correlation functions where both chiral and anti-chiral degrees of freedom are involved and coupled to each other. So it is possible to associate to band G, the modular of G bundles on X over complex numbers. And more generally, uh, actually, some much a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, can also be done for curves over, over, over any local field, such as the field of periodic numbers. We can associate to it a natural Hilbert space and define analogs of the Hegge operators acting on a dense subspace. We conjecture that they give rise to mutually commuting normal compact operators. Moreover, if the field is really a field of complex numbers, these Hecke operators uh, come together with global holomorphic differential operators on Bungie, which were actually introduced earlier by Balance and Dreamfeld for the purposes of the categorical slash geometric language correspondence. But we also observe that there exist, that their complex conjugates are also meaningful. They are anti holomorphic uh, global differential operators. And so the idea is that we should take both of them, both uh, algebras together. So we conjecture, so this way we get this big commutative algebra comprising holomorphic differential operators, anti holomorphic differential operators, and integral Hecke operators. And we conjecture that the joint spectrum of this commutative algebra properly understood, some of it because differential operators are actually unbounded, can be identified with a set of what's called LG opers on X. LG opers are essentially flat LG bundles with an additional structure. But there is an interesting twist. So out of all LG opers, which form an affine space, in, in the case when LG is of a joint type, they just form an affine space. Uh, those which appear here and which parameterize the joint spectrum of this commutative algebra conjecturally, and we have proved it in some cases, are those opers which, whose monodromy lands in a split real form of LG. So for instance, if G is SLN, the LG is P, uh, PSLN, then it will be PSL and C, then you will consider PSL and C opers which have monodromy in PSL and C of PL, PSLN of R. For instance, let's say it's PSL2 of C, then we know that there is a special oper which has a monodromy valued in PSL2R, which corresponds to uniformization. And so let's say G is greater than one. And so uh, it will actually have an interpretation here in this story in the analytic language correspondence as labeling one of the, the joint eigenvalues of one of the one of the eigenvectors in this Hilbert space, in some sense, the largest eigenvalue. But there are many others as well, with, which was there is a countable set for P, in the case of PGL2 and we believe in general. So this spectrum actually, we expect the spectrum to be discrete, which is a very nice improvement over what happens uh, for curves over finite field where we usually have to deal with continuous part of the spectrum as well. So regardless, we obtain a certain correspondence, at least conjecturally, between the joint spectrum of analogs of these Hecke operators plus some other oper differential operators and some data associated to flat bundles. Of course, flat bundles, the, the standard law is that a flat bundle is the same as a homomorphism from the fundamental group to uh, say of the, of the same surface to LG. And so fundamental group is, is like the Galois group and ramified quotient of the Galois group. So this really look like Galois representations that I talked about in the context of the curves of a finite field. And that's why this statement can really be viewed as an analytic language correspondence. It is somewhat surprising here that it is really the split real form that appears and not say the compact form. 
I also I would like to mention also that the spectral problem can actually be viewed as a quantum integral system, which is quite interesting, but I'm going, not going to talk about this aspect today. So maybe uh, some basic definitions of what we are talking about. So uh, in fact, I will talk about a slightly uh, more general uh, context where in addition to, it's not just unramified, but you allow ramification, but what, what mathematicians usually call tame ramification at finitely many points. So X is smooth projective reducible curve over complex numbers. And you have a finite subset S, KX is a canonical line bundle. You have a connected simple algebraic group over, um, over C and you have its Langlands dual group. So then you have this bund G, which is really the algebraic stack of pairs where you have a G bundle and the reduction of, uh, of, this of the fiber of this bundle at each point of this finite subset to B, where B is a Borel subgroup, a fixed Borel subgroup of G. Now, how do you define a Hilbert space on an algebraic stack? So we, we don't know, but the nice thing is that this algebraic stack in, in uh, under favorable conditions, it has an open dense substack, which is, which is for all intents and purposes an algebraic variety over C. And so if this is open and dense over complex numbers. So of course you expect that whatever the Hilbert space of, Hilbert space of the stack is, it's not going to um, know about things of measure zero. So we might as well just define a Hilbert space as the Hilbert space of this open dense part. So what is the open dense part? It is a substack of those stable pairs whose group of automorphisms is the center. Now, for instance, uh, the second condition is not, for instance, if you are willing to work with, with GLN or PGLN, you, you don't need to worry about the second condition. The, all, all stable pairs will automatically have, if I remember correctly, will have this this other second property but for general groups this cuts out a small a smaller part of the stable of a stable uh, uh, locus okay so now we would like to make this assumption that i already mentioned that this substack uh, of stable they call regularly stable actually stable and the group automorphisms are as small as possible the center of the group is open and dense which means that the, the usual stability condition if you will so the genus of X is greater than one, S is arbitrary, or it's an elliptic curve, and you have at least one point, or you have P1, at least three points. Now, this stack is more or less the same as the corresponding course moduli space. The technical term is that it is a gerb, ZG gerb over the smooth algebraic or the smooth algebraic variety. But the point is that for our purposes, this algebraic variety is a good replacement for the stack because even if this gerb is non-trivial, all the objects that we're interested in are descent. Uh, to, to this variety. So, and this is really honest to goodness smooth algebraic variety. So we define a Hilbert space associated to this. Now, how do you define it? We don't, as I told you, we don't have a natural measure, but there is a, 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 a easy way, sort of easy way around it. As physicists often do, you just take half forms, half densities. On half densities, you do have a natural emission inner product because you can multiply you have two half densities, you can multiply half density and its compass conjugate, and you get a volume form which you can integrate without making any additional choices. So to define half densities, of course, we have to define half forms, holomorphic half forms, and then take the tensor product with holomorphic, anti-holomorphic half forms. So, but, okay, so this is, Balance and Dreamfield have taught us how to define the square root of the canonical line bundle, sometimes, this requires the choice of a square root of the canonical line bundle on X. So it's kind of a spin structure on the Riemann surface, if you will, which is kind of natural from a physics point of view as well. If, if it is required, we will make such a choice. Um, however, when you tensor this square root, the holomorphic square root and anti-holomorphic square root, this ambiguity will cancel, this ambiguity will cancel each other. So it, it, the, the, the bundle that we will get in the end, half densities, will not uh, depend on these choices. So uh, then a small notation is uh, if you have a line bundle, holomorphic line bundle, you can tensor it with an anti-holomorphic line bundle, which gives you gives rise to a C infinity line bundle, a smooth line bundle, which I will denote as just absolute value, even though a more proper way would be to call it squared modules. So now the bundle half densities is defined as just K one half tensor K one half bar. And we take 
the space of completely supported sections of this line bundle, C infinity line bundle, because see it now involves, we want to integrate. So we need both holomorphic and anti-holomorphic degrees of freedom, right? And so um, on this on this regular, uh, regular uh, stable locus. And then we define the uh, positive definite emission form on it in the usual way by, by uh, given two half densities, multiply the first with the complex conjugate of the second, and then you take, take the Hilbert space completion of VG with this emission form. That's your Hilbert space. So the next question is, what kind of operators could we have on this Hilbert space? Because by itself, Hilbert space is, okay, it's nice, but we, we really want to uh, uh, talk about the joint spectra of some computing operators. So what, in the case of a curve of a finite field, integration was a um, kind of a cakewalk. It was easy because all the measures were, all the integrals were actually finite sums. Not so here. And so we have to be very careful in how we define operators acting in the Hilbert space. And that's the principal difference between uh, the case of a curve of a finite field and the case of a curve of a, of a complex field. In a sense, the payback is that some of the things have become simpler over complex field. And I still don't understand why. For instance, why, do we, why is it that the spectrum is discrete, at least in all cases that we know? Whereas for curves over a finite field, this is not so. And this is not, certainly not so in the number field case. Now, in brackets, is a little digression. This conference is about number theory. So I, I'm not, when I talk about curves over finite field, for me, that is a proxy uh, for the first colon in the Rosetta Stone of Andre Vey, where you're really considering number field, questions of number fields, where instead of field of rational functions over curve, over a curve over a finite field, you actually have an honest to goodness, a number field like the field of rational numbers or a finite extension thereof. A lot of things in this first and two columns are similar. In a way, the second column is simpler than the first one, but many of the phenomena are very parallel, are very much parallel. So to me, that is, in today's lecture at least, is a proxy for the number field case. And now we're comparing it sort of what's happening for curves over, over, complex, uh, over complex numbers. So, uh, and there is something new. It's a new element which we did not have over finite field that we can now have holomorphic differential operators and anti-holomorphic differential operators. So in fact, it turns out that there are three classes of operators that are worth studying here, holomorphic differential operators, anti-holomorphic differential operators, and heck operators, which are integral operators. But there are challenges. So the first challenge is differential operators are unbounded as physicists very, know very well. In other words, they are only defined on a, on a dense subspace, usually over Hilbert space. And you have to be very careful in uh, introducing the notion of self-adjoint operators so that you could use spectral theorems and so on. It, it is often very difficult to prove that given that certain operators which are defined on some subspace can be extended to real, really, really self-adjoint operators. It is highly non-trivial to define the self-adjoint extensions, but which is necessary to be able to make sense of the spectra. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense, actually. Now, Heck operators are nicer because they're integral operators. We first define them on a dense subspace, but we conjecture that unlike differential operators, they can actually extend by continuity to operators on the entire Hilbert space, so they're bounded operators. Moreover, we expect them to be compact operators and also normal so that they have a very nice spectrum, uh, the, the spectral decomposition. Uh, the intersection of the kernel, joint kernel, kernel um, of this operators we expect to be zero. So in fact, we get a very nice spectral problem because we can um, decompose the Hilbert space into a completely direct sum of finite dimensional. We know that eigenspace are finite dimensional. And it is this interplay. So, but Heck operate is, is a weird thing. So Heck operates are nice in a, in a fun functional analysis sense, but a priori it is not clear what the spectra, the algebra of Heck operators is kind of strange. It doesn't reveal too much about itself. Differential operators on the other hand, have a very clear interpretation. We have a very clear interpretation of their spectra, their opers, as I will talk about in a moment. And it is the fact that we have both and they commute with each other in a certain sense that, ena that enables us to, first of all, obtain a spectral decomposition using Heck operators, but then also to, to label the, the eigenvalues, the joint eigenvalues in terms of opens. Okay, so let's talk first about the holomorphic differential operators. 
let's consider the case of simply connected group for simplicity and also that there is no that the genus greater than one and we have no parabolic structure. We have the sheaf of differential operators acting on this line bundle, right? Because we want differential operators which act on the half densities, but half densities is a tensor product of what I call half for, holomorphic half forms and anti holomorphic half forms. Holomorphic operators will act on the holomorphic half forms. It turns out that there, are, uh, there is a big algebra of global holomorphic differential operators acting on this line bundle, unlike other bundles. It's a very special line bundle on which we suddenly have a large algebra of commuting holomorphic differential operators. And Bellison and Dreamfield describe this algebra as the algebra of functions on the space of opers, LG opers, which I mentioned earlier. This space is just an affine space uh, of, for example, for SL2, GSL2, LG, PGL2, uh, it's it's a very, it's an, an affine space of dimension three g minus three, complex complex affine space, which is modeled on the quadratic differential, holomorphic quadratic differential. And so, an LG well, the there is a definition which I, we're not going to use. One one case that we should uh, consider, we will consider in more detail, is the case of uh, PGL two opers which are projective connections, the same as projective connections. They're second order homomorphic differential operators acting from K minus one half on X to K three halves. Or sturm liouville operators, if you will. So these are classical things, which are, we cast now as opers as a, for the simplest uh, non-abelian, uh, for the simplest simple Lie group. So this is, if you take all of these operators acting like this, second order on the curve, X is our curve, right? These operators of this form. Um, they form an affine space of dimension 3G minus three, and the algebra of global differential operators turns out to be the algebra of polynomial functions on it. In other words, there are exactly three G minus three algebraically independent global differential operators. They all have order two on band G. They commute with each other and they have no relations. They're free. They generate a free commutative algebra, polynomial algebra. Now, it is worth, but for my purposes, it is worth mentioning that how the balance and Drifel came up with this result. In fact, they came up with it uh, from a local statement. And by local statement, I mean, I want to draw the same picture as before that you have a Riemann surface, right? And um, you have a point. So a local means that you're zooming in on, uh, on a disk around a particular point X on this curve. Right? So the local story is a story about the affine Katsumuri algebra, uh, which kind of uniformizes the modular space of G bundles, as we know. Um, here, T is just a, like a coordinate at this, at this point. And so the, we know that to this affine Katsumuri algebra, we can associate, and any level K, we can associate the chiral or vertex algebra is generated by the holomorphic Katsumuri currents, which usually this is denote J A of Z. What we are interested in is a special case, um, which is called the critical level, when K is minus blue Coxter number, for instance, minus two for SL2. And we can talk about the center of this vertex algebra. That is to say, all the currents that you can build uh, out of the Katsumuri currents and their, um, their derivatives, which would commute by, with them, by, you know, with themselves and with the Katsumuri currents. So that's the center of the vertex algebra. And so it's known that this, uh, the center is, is big for this level. And actually, the funny thing is that if you are away from the critical level, the center is actually trivial. It's just the identity operator, that's it. Corresponding to the vacuum vector in this chiral algebra. But at the critical level, it's large. And it turns out to be isomorphic to polynomial functions on the local counterpart, the space that we had in the previous slide. That is say opens on the disk, at this disk, at the, uh, at the point at the point x, okay? So let's be a little bit more concrete in the case of uh, SL2. So first of all, at the critical level for, for any Lie group, for any Lie algebra, we know the Shugavara current, the quadratic Shugavara current. And it is known that at the critical level, away from the critical level, if you normalize it by dividing by K plus blue Coxeter number, you will get a stress tensor. You'll get a Virasor, a field uh, having the operator product expansion of Virasor. But precisely at the critical level, when K is minus blue Coxeter number, you cannot divide by K plus blue Coxeter number. So you cannot get a stress tensor, but this field is still very interesting because actually suddenly it becomes central. 
It actually commutes with the cuts moody currents. If the Lie algebra is not SL2, there will be other higher Sugawara currents, which are much harder to write, for which much, it is much harder to write explicit formulas. But in the case of SL2, we are in luck. This Sugawara current actually generates everything in the center. The center is actually equal to um, really polynomials in S of Z in its derivatives. Why do I write polynomials? You don't need to put normal order, normally ordered product for them because they commute with each other. Moreover, they commute with the Katsumori currents as well. So you can either think about this way as derivatives of the Shugavara, but by state field correspondence, you can also think of it as polynomials in the sort of creation modes of this field S of Z, which are the ones starting with minus two because it's a field of conformal dimension two. So on the other hand, the PGL2 oper, as I mentioned, is a projective connection. So second order holomorphic differential operator, it has this form, dz squared minus v of z, except now it's acting on the disk. So I should have, I should have written here dx and here dx, okay? So now you can write it in a, in a, in a, in a Fourier series and I want to use this, retain the same um, uh, notation. So I will write it as n less than or equal to minus two, but the degree will be minus n minus two to make it non-negative. So the polynomial functions on operas are just polynomials in Vn in this Fourier coefficients. Whereas the center is polynomials in Sn in Shugavara field car, uh, components of the Shugavara tensor, starting with minus second and going to, uh, Minus infinity. So the claim from the previous slide, this theorem of Fagin, Fagin and myself, that the center is isomorphic to polynomial algebras on operas on the disk, then becomes a very concrete statement that two polynomial algebras um, in generators labeled by integers less than or equal to minus two are isomorphic to each other. So of course, the isomorphic simply sends this S center to this VN. It's properly normalized by one half to, to make it uh, to make it an isomorphic. Now it's not just an isomorphic commutative algebra because the fact is that we can we can uh, um, deform the level away from the physical level, and then these operators will become will generate the Verasor algebra. So we can talk about the Poisson structure on them, whereas the space of Oppers also has a Poisson structure, a kind of a chiral algebra version of Poisson structure, sometimes called chiral Poisson or vertex Poisson. And so this isomorphism actually is an isomorphism of Poisson algebras or Karel Poisson algebra. Okay, now how is this related to Banji? Well, Banji, as I mentioned earlier, is a double quotient of the loop group. And so you see this Lie algebra GX. Well, the group, G, 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 uh, the group GX, uh, G tensor um, Laran series, it would act from the right, right. Uh, uh, specific, depending on the level, will act on a specific line bundle on this quotient. But then the universal enveloping, so they like by vector fields, but the universal enveloping algebra will act, or, or first order differential operators, the universal enveloping algebra will act by differential operators. And then the central elements in the enveloping algebra will act in such a way that the action will descend to the double quotient because naturally it will commute with the second subgroup that, by which you want to mod out. That's how you can go from central elements in the enveloping algebra of the Katsumuri algebra or the chiral algebra, the Katsumuri chiral algebra, to differential operators on Banji. And in fact, the critical level corresponds precisely to the line bundle that we are interested in K1 half. And so we get a, a homomorphism from the center to the differential operators and which fits in this commutative diagram. So the center of the chiral algebra maps to um, differential operators. And in fact, it is, this is surjective. And the, we have isomorphic, this is balance and Dreamfield isomorphism. And this is Fagin and myself. They fit in this commutative diagram. This, of course, is a natural homomorphism where, which corresponds to the inclusion of regular operas on X by, into operas on the disk by obtaining simply by, by obtaining by restricting an opera to the disk. Okay. So, 
Now, this was all about holomorphic differential operators. And, uh, and I have made a connection to things familiar to us from conformal field theory, namely uh, chiral algebra of Kasmuri algebra and its center, which in the case of SL2 is generated by Shugavar field. We should remember this because it will come handy in a moment. But before I, I, I exploit this fact, I would like to uh, draw your attention that there is an anti-holomorphic counterpart to this story. Because we can take complete conjugates of these holomorphic differential operators. And what are we going to get? We're going to get anti-holomorphic differential operators acting on K1 half bar, the complex conjugate of the bundle of half forms, which is an anti-holomorphic line bundle. So they are going to generate a commutative algebra as well, DG bar, which is isomorphic to functions on what we can call anti opers or anti holomorphic opers. Now, DG bar naturally commutes with DG because holomorphic differential operators commute with anti holomorphic differential operators naturally. So we can take the tensor product of this algebra over complex numbers and we get a commutative algebra which acts on smooth sections. Now it, it combines holomorphic and anti holomorphic degrees of freedom. So we want to act by it on C infinity sections of the line bundle, which is a tensor product of this two. Okay, so now this operates are, are rather complicated because they're simple. If you look at their symbols, you will see that they actually, they are, they are what's called the Hitchin Hamiltonians for the holomorphic ones and likewise anti-holomorphic. And so they actually have, a, um, if you look at the common zeros of this, you get what's called the you know, potent cone in the cotangent bundle to the to the to band G, and so this this means that uh, if, when we write down differential equations involving these operators, they're going to have a a very complicated behavior on the projection of the of this new potent cone minus the zero section onto band G, and so that necess to 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 get a sort of a, a first look. At what's happening here, it is wise to restrict ourselves to what's called very stable G bundles. So it means that we are not, uh, we are outside of this locus, which, which comes from the nilpotent core, considering bundles which do not ag admit nilpotent Higgs fields. And so uh, now we can look at, at solution, we can look at the differential equations defined by this holomorphic and anti-holomorphic operators, you see, uh, corresponding to some eigenvalues. So it's eigenspace of this big algebra combining holomorphic anti holomorphic, right? And we can look at both of them where the eigenvalues, what are the eigenvalues? The eigenvalues are points in the spectrum in the algebraic geometry sense, spectrum of these algebras. For the homomorphic, it is an oper, and for the anti homomorphic, it's an anti oper. Now, the first system is, is known as a quantum Hitchin system, and it has been. Uh, the kind of a cornerstone of the balance on Dreamfield approach to the categorical language correspondence. In the balance on Dreamfield approach to the categorical language correspondence, we only consider the system one, the holomorphic equations, or to use a fancy language, they define the left D module by taking the, the shift differential operators and, and, and dividing by an idea, it's, it's right ideal. They prove that the shifts are heck eigen shifts. So they are actually eigen shifts. In the categorical setting, they are like eigenfunctions, except they are, they are eigen, eigen objects of, of functors, so that the eigenvalues are not numbers, but vector spaces and so on. Something which you know, is familiar also to physicists in the setting of uh, uh, categories of brains as explained by Kapustin Witten, where you are considering say, a Hoft operator acting on the category of A brains. And when uh, there are some special A brains such that when you act by a Hoft line operator, this A brain gets multiplied by a vector space, which then behaves in a nice way as you move your point around and so on. So, but the, 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 point, the reason why we only, we only, we are forced to consider uh, the modules here is because there is no natural function. There's no natural section. There's no natural solution of this equation alone because these are holomorphic equations only. They don't only take care of holomorphic degrees of freedom. And the, this, Locally, this, these equations have a multi-dimensional space of solutions. Locally on this bungee, uh, very stable. These are holomorphic solutions of the system. They are sections of a bundle with a flat connection, which have very non-trivial monodromy. As we go around this locus of not very stable bundles, also known as wobbly bundles. 
See, so that's why we, that's why it's, if you are willing to only work with holomorphic degrees of freedom and, and not consider anti-holomorphic, there is no choice of a function. There is no choice of a section that you can possibly make in a natural way. And that's why um, it was considered, uh, uh, a way out was to consider the entire object. And lo and behold, actually it turns out to be an eigenobject of the Hecke functors, you see. But now where we venture in the waters of uh, functional analysis and combine the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic degrees of freedom. So we have both a uh, system holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, what I called one and two. And we look now, of course, then we lose algebra. It's not algebraic or holomorphic anymore. We look at, we look for smooth solutions and we ask whether sometimes for specific chi and mu, there could be a single valid solution. Very much like uh, constructing um, correlation functions in conformal field theory out of conformal and anti-conformal blocks, except usually in conformal field theory, our moduli space on which we, with, uh, over we, which is our playground is MGN, is a moduli space of, of curves with punctures, right? Uh, and so the, we have the vector bundles or with a project reflect connection, corresponding to conformal blocks, their complex conjugates, and then there is a mission in our product, if we're lucky, which then allows us to produce single valued sections, so, right? Here we are working with Bungie. Why? Because actually we don't have a stress tensor. That's the weird thing about the critical level. We, we cannot move in any, in any obvious way, just in the same way as we do away from critical level. We cannot move, we cannot change the complex structure on the curve or move the points around and so on. However, we still got Bungie and we can play the same game with Bungie as we usually play with uh, moduli of curves, moduli of function, function curves, MGN. And so then the solution would then be a bilinear expression involving local, local solutions of holomorphic equations and local solutions of the anti-holomorphic equations. Sometimes they can combine into something single value. And that by some argument with D modules and so on, at least in the case of SLN, where we use some results of Dennis Gates degree, we can find out that actually it, is, it puts a bound on this space of this item space. It, it, it cannot be more than one dimensional, you see. So it's going to be, we expect it to be finite dimensional in general. And even for SLN, we can tell sort of on some general grounds that it is at most one dimensional. So that's what this game is about. It's about finding these bilinear combinations from this point of view. And so now the conjecture is, from this point of view, the conjecture is that all of these eigenspaces are actually L2, consist of L2 functions. So they actually live in the Hilbert space. It belongs, it's a, define a subspace in the Hilbert space, which is not at all, uh, obvious, and there is an orthogonal decomposition of the Hilbert space by in terms of this eigenspaces. Moreover, we can we we can so see that there are two parameters a priori: the opera and anti-opera, chi and mu. But of course, the point is that this uh, we expect these operators to be the the eye joint of the holomorphic operator to be more or less the anti will be some anti holomorphic operator. So there is a, a, a twist by Chevalier involution which kind of uh, gives you um, a uh, atomorphism of the Dinkin diagram, uh, like for SLN exchanges the first and last fundamental weights and so on. But say for SL2, it's not going to matter anyway. Uh, up to that, the second parameter is actually just the complex conjugate. The anti is just the complex conjugate of the oper. And so that's how we get to this set of LG opers such that the monodromy representation is a smart twist complex conjugate, which we expect to be first of all a discrete subset known for SL2 due to faultings. And also um, we expect it to be so in general. Uh, by the way, for SL2, this conjecture implements ideas of York Teschner. He had a paper in 2018 in which he sort of laid out this, um, this idea of using both uh, holomorphic differential operators, which are holomorphic Hitchin Hamiltonians in tandem with anti-holomorphic Hitchin Hamiltonians and looking at the single value solutions. He did not ask about L2, but uh, questions of Hilbert space and so on, but he did anticipate that the, the corresponding single value solutions would be, uh, could be linked to this real opus. So it's in that sense, this conjecture implements his ideas. Okay. Um, also, this, is a, this looks a little abstract when I say, 
the monodromic representation is isomorphic to its complex conjugate. In fact, we expect, and it is known for SL2, and even a more general case, that these are the operas with real monodromy. So the monodromy actually lands in the real form of LGR of LGC, known for SL2 due to faultings, and we can prove it for general G also in the case when there is at least one Borel reduction, one point of Borel reduction. Okay, so so that's the well, that's what we that's how much mileage we can get just from balancing the input result about the description of holomorphic. Uh, differential operators by simply observing that the complex, complex conjugates are also going to be commuting differential operators, which also commute with holomorphic ones and so on. Uh, writing the doubled, doubled Hitchin, quantum Hitchin system. And so on. The problem is that actually proving this is an incredibly difficult task because these operators are unbounded and it is not clear at the outset at all and not even clear how in general one could prove just you know, using these differential operators, that they do have self-adjoint extension. In our first paper, we tried to do it. And even in the case of CP1 with four points, it turned out to be a very a daunting task. This is where Heck operators come to the rescue because you see Heck operators are integral operators which have much better analytic properties. So they actually give rise to bounded operators, at least conjecturally, which we expect to be normal compact with trivial common kernel. For such operators, where it's the best possible world in Hilbert spaces, so that the Hilbert space decomposes it into finite dimensional, mutually orthogonal eigenspaces of these normal operators, commuting operators. Okay. And so then, the, because they commute, then if we prove that they commute with the differential operators, then they help, that they can help us to, they can, using that, we can prove the conjecture that I, uh, the previous conjecture. Now, my time is limited, so I'm almost out of time, but I would like to do this. So in, before, uh, well, I was, I was hoping to give you mathematical definition, but it looks like I, I probably won't have time, but you will be able to see my, my slides anyway. Um, but I, what I would like to really talk about, and perhaps I can have five minutes, five minutes for this. I would like to talk about, so the Hecker operators are essential. I explain why they're essential. So what are they? How can we infer their existence? And so the point I would like to make now is that these operators are very natural from the point of view of conformal field theory, two-dimensional conformal field theory. Let's look at the case of PGL2 and the dual group is SL2. So for the first thing I wanna say is that there are some natural chiral vertex operators of the Katz-Moody algebra, which I would like to denote phi MN, where MN are positive integer. The fastest way to explain what they are is to say that if we apply quantum Greenfield sokolov reduction to these operators, we will get the more familiar chiral MN vertex operators of the conformal field theory with Verasor symmetry which naturally appear in the minimal models, but also in Lilville theory, right? Now there are two extreme cases. So you, when you set one of the parameters equal to one, there are sort of electric up, vertex operators, which are kind of innate to the, um, to the theory at hand. So they are labeled by representations of the group G itself. M, M uh, appears as a parameter representation of the group itself. But then there are also dual ones, the magnetic ones and uh, which for which the other parameter is equal to one. They are labeled by the highest weight of the dual group in general. And it is the latter which have a nice limit when le the level goes to the critical value. And in fact, in this limit, not only the, it's just, a, 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 you just take it directly without any problems, they also become, they also commute with each other. So they kind of, they become, they kind of define a commutative sector in the, uh, in the, uh, and, uh, amongst all the possible operators. The simplest one is V112 one, one, and has conformal dimension minus one half. So they, they behave, it behaves as a section of the line bundle Kx minus one half on the, on the Riemann surface X, okay? Now, observe that this chiral operator V1, so if you buy this, and, which is very standard in, in, in conformal field theory, if you buy this and you also know that there is, a, you can take its complex conjugate, so it's going to be chiral, the anti-chiral analog, V bar one half, which now depends on Z bar and is a section of Kx bar minus one half on X. And so the idea is that it is possible to naturally cook up a certain mixed vertex operator, which depends on both Z and Z bar, which I will call phi one, one two, which is now going to be a section of K minus one half times K bar minus one half. Don't confuse it with K on Bungie. This is K really, on, this is, this operator is for now just living, there's no Bungie yet. It's just operates living on a Riemann surface. 
there are, there are several ways to construct it, but the, the kind of the easiest way to do it perhaps is to observe that actually, when I say operators, they're not really operators, but there are sections of rank, of rank two bundle. So they have two components, both of them, chiral and antichiral. But there is a way to combine them. So they, why two dimensional? Because they corresponds to the two dimensional representation of the dual group SL2, which is a defining representation of SL2. So we can construct it as a bilinear combination of these operators, which is single valued. And now the point is that the Hecke operators that I want to define, roughly speaking, from the point of view of two dimensional conform field theory, correspond to inserting this mixed vertex operator, phi one two, into the correlation functions of whatever you want to call two dimensional CFT at the critical level. That's now that's, I'm not sure what this theory really is, and I'm not trying to make sense of it, right? So I'm just formally using word identities and things like that to think about these operators and various properties that they satisfy. Know that I, in any case, I mean here, not conformal, not just the chiral sector of a CFT, of a conformal field theory, but a full-fledged 2D CFT combining chiral and anti-chiral sector. Let's suppose that this can be done. This, so this, I, I give sort of a blueprint of how to do it. So now from this point of view, it's not surprising that this operator, for example, would satisfy an analog of the familiar BPZ equation from the study of two-dimensional CFT with Brasor image. And in fact, one can prove this equation and it has the form of a kind of universal opera equation. And this is maybe the last thing I will say is that the reason is that actually you have a, just like in the case of BPZ equation, you can def derive it from a decoupling of a no vector, if you will, you know. So this was all the rage, you know, in the eighties and so <laughs> But it, But keep in mind, we are not in the Verasor situation here. This is really a bona fide vertex operator for Katz Moody. Now, by using free field realization, you can relate to it to uh, something that has to do with classical Verasora. But it is more than that. It is really, um, it's not a classical thing. It is a quantum operator, and yet it satisfies a classical equation. Why? Because the Shugavara tensor becomes commutative. It decouples as a kind of a commutative sector of your conformal field theory. So the result is this beautiful equation, second order equation, that dz squared s of minus s of z annihilates this chiral operator, which is a very straightforward, it's a very straightforward uh, fact one can prove by pure representation theory, okay? But what this means is that when we, when we cook up this mixed operator that from V one half and V bar one half, it will also satisfy the same equation plus its complex conjugate. These are the local differential equations from which we can then de derive global differential equations on, um, and here, here it is a sketch, but I'm out of time, so let me skip this. At the end of the day, there is a certain universal OPER, or SL2 OPER, a universal projective connection, which is both a differential operator along the curve and the differential operator along the moduli space of PGL2 bundles. And just formally, you can, you can, you can see right away that if you, have, if you have a meaningful correlation function in which you have this operator at the point Z, and there may be some other operators, then sigma applied to, to, the, to this. Other operators which do not, have, do not create singularity, so to speak, for the sugar variety. Then applying sigma to it, you get zero. This is universal open. So now the, let me conclude uh, because I'm out of time, but you're welcome to ask me more and then I'll give more details or you're welcome to uh, look at the, at the slides, which I will send to the organizers or you're welcome to read our papers and so on. But the point is that we define Hecke operator seemingly in a different way um, uh, by integrating over some Hecke response and so on. But for the, I think for the purpose of this conference, it might be useful to think in terms of this conformal field theory approach where these operators is are really what I just described, inserting this mixed phi one two operator into the creation function. In any case, we have proved that this Hecke operator, at least in the case of SLN and conjecture in general, that, well, this is the case of SL2, so yes, we definitely proved, but also for SLN, uh, that, this, that our Hecke operators that we defined mathematically, they satisfy these equations, you see. Now, the proof that we give in our second paper that I mentioned is purely global, but the lo local to global argument, which I sketched just now, can also be made mathematically rigorous. And so, it actually provides an alternative proof. 
no, it's not that, you know, if you think about it, it's not that different, but okay. And this equations allow us to express the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators in terms of the eigenvalues of the global differential operators. So kind of this, the, the circle closes in the sense that all, all three components, all three types of, um, I'll just leave this slide so that you can see more or less a little bit about the differential operators. Um, maybe I'll go back, okay. The point is that uh, for complex curves, we have very good control on the eigenvalues of the Hecke operators in terms of in terms of eigenvalues of differential operators, and that enables us to describe the spectrum and uh, obtain this analytical analysis correspondence. All right. Since I'm out of time, I'd like to stop, and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions to the speaker? Oh, maybe I, I'll ask. So, so an alternative definition is just the integration over the fibers of Hecke correspondences. That's right. So the, the mathematical, the most straightforward mathematical definition is to look at the Hecke correspondence. Yes. So you have actually for general, um, for a general group. So you have this, and in, in yes. your integral do, dominant weight, you have this correspondence yes. between band G and X times band G. Yes. So in the geometric language correspondence, we use uh, this correspondence in the sense of algebraic geometry as a function to construct a functor. You have a D module here, you pull it back and you push forward, right? So, but now we are doing, we are using this correspondence to, to define a, a real operator, integral operators. However, they're not on functions, they are on half forms. And in general, you would expect, you would say, okay, well, there would be too, too much of a luck if you could pull back the half form here and you would get something which on the one hand descends to half form here and also has, um, is a volume form on, along the fibers. And yet that is the case, which is expressed by this isomorphism due to Belson Dreamford and Bravo Mankarta. That, that there is a certain matching between uh, half forms and the uh, relative, relative uh, bundle of a relative canonical bundle, which enables us to really define uh, this integration without making any choices, without making any, defining any measure of integration. And then we just, that's how we define. Now, of course, then the issue is whether the integral converges. And that's why initially, at least, we define it only on the open dense subspace of the Hilbert space. And then conjecturally, it extends by continuity. So it's a bounded, it's really a bounded operator, which then moreover is compact for each X and Lambda and they commute with each other and so on. We have been able to prove it so far in the case when the group is PGL2 and the curve is CP1. And then you have three or more parabolic points with parabolic structures. We expect okay. it to be in true in general. But also if you have what's called the minimal correspondence, then the domain of integration is compact. If you have like what's called min minuscule. That's right, that's right. So that the best situation is where Lambda is a minuscule weight then um, the fibers are compact uh, for, um, so for example, if you take the group to be PGL2, the fibers will be projective lines. For the general group, you, the fibers will be isomorphic to what's called the uh, orbit in the Grassmannian, in the affine Grassmannian, and you have to compactify it. And then there is a, a little subtlety that has to do with defining the integration. But this was actually taken care of by Ryman Cash done some years ago. So that, that there is some nice property that there is a, we're dealing with this closures of the, uh, this orbits, they are Gorenstein and they have regular singularities. And so there's a well-defined integration theory for this. So in, at the end of the day, we're integrating over this, oh, well, at the end of the day, we're integrating over a resolution of singularity of that computation. But the result does not depend on the resolution singularity. Okay, thank you. Some other questions? Okay, then uh, let me ask a question. So, uh, is there any logical interdependence be between analytic version and the categorical version you mentioned at the beginning? Is it like a it's yes. complementary, but is there any some statement? I, well, I would need I would need maybe another hour to explain it. <laughs> okay. But okay. for instance, uh, so for instance, this this diag this this diagram could be useful because you see, um, 
correspondences in algebraic geometry yes. versus correspondences in analysis, right? So mm -hmm. for, for me personally, I, so I made a little discovery while you know working on this project, which is that they are actually very closely connected. So I didn't expect this how closely connected because I am more used, you know, by, by virtue of my own upbringing, so to speak, as a mathematician to just stay within the realm of holomorphic algebraic and so on. So for me, the reflex is that if you have a, a correspondence like this, is that it gives you a functor from category of some particular category of shifts here to shifts here, right? Yes. And so now the point is that, uh, for instance, you could take the category of D modules and you can pull back and push forward. You can kind of say twisted D modules that, that when you have a line bundle also in play uh, here and here, and they have to match together the way I explained, which is what happens here, right? So that you have actually K one half. So you can then apply this functor, uh, but so you, you use pullback and push forward of D modules, right? Yes. And traditionally, you know, if you if you if you take a class in a, in a theory of D modules, they look very strange. These operations, and some tensor products are some really weird. Actually, uh, all the textbooks that I have ever 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 read, I never understood what the meaning, and I finally understood that. It's exactly, they satisfy exactly, the, the, we impose exactly the equations which are needed to make the integral transform at the level of functions or sections of line bundles. Mm -hmm. Meaningful. For instance, when you integrate, the integral annihilates uh, total derivatives, right? So if you, let's say you integrate over compact mm -hmm. or, or manifold, so it's well defined, it annihilates uh, total derivatives. And guess what? When you do push forward in the category of D modules, you take the quotient. First of all, that's why it's a right D <coughs> module because you mod out by the left ideal generated by, by derivatives. You know. Sorry, by the right, right ideal generated by derivatives. Likewise, pullback, if you have a section and you pull back, it's going to be invariant under the vector fields which are uh, go along the fibers, mm -hmm. right? Because you take a pullback. So it's going to be constant along the fiber. And that's how you define the pullback. And so when you follow this, you will see that actually you can learn about, for instance, you can write down the equation on this operate, Hecke operator in the function and functional analysis sense as an integral operator, honest to goodness operator as in a second year of calculus. That it's such the equation can be obtained from, from by, by looking at the functor and its action on the D modules, you see. So that's one example of how the two stories are intertwined. And in fact, this is how I think we would be able to learn geometric language correspondence, categorical language correspondence in a different universe. <laughs> you know, let's say in a different universe, mathematicians or physicists, whoever was first or together, discovered the analytic language correspondence first, and they didn't think about categorical one. But then they would observe that actually. With this Hecke operator, for instance, you can play with it and you can apply differential operators to it. And as a result, they would discover D modules and they would discover the Hecke functor and they would discover that the shift of differential operators is an eigen shift of the Hecke functor, you see. So that's sort of a, what I mean when I say that the two stories go hand in hand. I see, I see. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Or maybe I, I ask one, one more question. So when you do, do the integration, you don't touch the points where, where you have the Borel structure. Or that's right, that's right. Okay. Only away from separate, those points, yes, as yeah. usual, as we do usually, right? Uh, so only right, the yeah. unramified points. Yes, yes. But in principle, you can do even on those points, but it would be an analog of the non-commutative Hecke algebra. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We have not studied this question, but I think that's, what, well, that's one of the interesting open questions at the mm -hmm. moment. What kind of things you you would get uh, when you do when you try to make a a, a, a fine Hecke algebra? I don't know how fine Hecke algebra. Okay. Any other questions? Well, let's thank Edward again for his beautiful. Thank, thank you. you.